Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to see so many people um, with us today from so many countries. Um, I don't know about where you are, but here in Poznan, where I'm based, the weather is absolutely glorious. It's a very, very sunny day, so it's a really good start to the webinar today. But we're not going to talk about the weather today, obviously. We are going to talk about CLIL. Now, even if you're not sure what CLIL really is, you may have been using CLIL methodology for many years. And if you look at all these acronyms that have been around for quite some time, like BUILD or CLIP or FLIP or FLAME or LAC, and then the good old fashioned teaching content through English and teaching English through content. But also if you've been using course books, or extra materials such as, for example, simplified readers for children, um, the CLIL element has been integrated in those materials as well, more and more. So what is CLIL? Now, um, imagine that um, you have two elements which are essential and which need to be used together. And these two elements are content and language. And when we talk about content, we talk about subject matter, such as, for example, geography, maths, um, biology, etc. And when we talk about language, then obviously in our case, that's English as a foreign language. And now imagine that you integrate these elements um, in the learning process. And what we come up with is content and language integrated lang learning, or CLIL. Now, there are two extremely important concepts when we talk about CLIL, and the first one is scaffolding. And scaffolding is really um, helping learners through creating a support structure in a very similar way to um, uh, building a scaffolding or a support structure when we build a house. And the second important concept is Bloom's taxonomy of learning objectives. Now, we're not going to spend time talking about these two concepts now, but we will come back to those concepts later on in the webinar. But in order to understand why CLIL is so important for us, what we need to look at is a little bit of demographics. As you probably know, since the 1940s, every single generation or every single important generation has received a name. And so we have had the generation of baby boomers, generation X, generation Y. We are now into generation Z. Now, the generation which is most important for us is Generation Y. Um, and there are two main reasons why this generation is so important for us. The first reason is that the majority of the people that we teach, the majority of our learners and students, actually come from that generation, from Generation Y. But there is another extremely important reason why this generation is so important for us, and that's because this generation, or millennials as they are sometimes called, have very different behaviors, um, values, attitudes from other generations, from previous generations. And that is in response to the technological and economic implications of the internet. And the millennials are the first generation of what we call digital natives. Now, digital natives and digital immigrants are concepts that I'm sure you have heard before because they're used quite a lot these days. And um, to very simply explain what a, what a digital native is, it's enough if we just look at this picture. A digital native is a person who was literally born with a smartphone or a tablet in their hand. To contrast that, digital immigrants are people like me, for example. I bought my first computer when I was over 20, and I bought my first mobile phone when I was over 30. So there is quite a difference between me and between the, the kids or the digital natives. And that difference is very nicely summarized in the next picture. Now, um, being a digital native, 
really means that students that we teach these days will have a different attitude to what happens not only in their private lives, not only in the context outside the classroom, but also to everything that happens inside the classroom. So what I would like to show you is a clip which has been prepared or made by um, pupils from Robin Hood Primary School in Birmingham, together with um, a film crew from National College for, um, for School Leadership. And before I show you the clip, I think one important um, comment is that I don't know about you, but I would love to be teaching in a school which is called uh, Robin Hood Primary School. Okay, so let's have a look at the clip. Okay, it seems that um, I've been seeing some comments that the video didn't really play very well. Um, it's probably because we've got so many participants in the room. We've actually got nearly 700, 700 people in the room, which is great, but it does affect the quality of connection. Um, what the, um, but I, hope, I still hope that you were able to pick up the main message from that video, and that was that learners really want to... Um, uh, the teachers to use modern technology um, to engage them in the learning process. So what is it that's so cool for Generation Y, the generation that we're talking about? Well, first of all, they want to learn in an active way. Um, they also place a lot of importance on collaboration. They want to work with other people, but it is our task as teachers to teach them how to collaborate most effectively. Another important feature of, or something that, that is very cool for Generation Y is that they are very socially engaged. And obviously, new technologies are extremely important for them. But more and more, you'll see that researchers are referring to a new kind of generation, and that's Generation C. So what is then that Generation C? Well, the name of Generation C comes from the word connected. And here is what is being said about Generation C. Look out, Generation X, Y, and Z. There's a new generation emerging, Generation C. Its members have one big thing in common. They're digital natives 
and exceptionally tech savvy. OK, well, that doesn't look very different from Generation Y. So why are we trying to make a difference here? Well, we're trying to make a difference because the previous generations that we talked about, the Generation X, Y, and Z, were represented by their demographic. They were represented by when they were born. Generation C is very different in that respect because it's represented by the psychographic. They're not necessarily similar in age, but they have got very similar attitudes, values, interests, and certain personality types. So basically, they are ageless. So why is this distinction between Generation Y and Generation C so important for us? Well, it's important because if we think about our students as Generation Y, then we put ourselves in an opposition to them as a different generation, as an earlier generation. But you may realize that in a lot of ways, we are actually very, very similar to our students. And if we refer to our students as Generation C, we could be part of the same generation. And that, that's very inclusive. Now, I'd like us to, to, to have a look at what Bonnie Knutson, who was a professor at the School of Hospitality Business at Michigan State University, um, says about her family gatherings. And what she says is, in fact, a perfect example of what Generation C is all about. She says, there are 10 of us in our immediate family, me, my husband, our two daughters, two sons-in-law, and four grandchildren who range from age nine to 20. When we, are all get, when we all get together at a hotel or resort for our annual sojourn, it seems as if we fill every electrical outlet in sight. PCs, Macs, iPods, e-readers, mobile phones multiplied by 10 equals at least 30 charges that might need plugging in at any one time. That's because we are all, repeat, all members of Generation C. And I think that very nicely summarizes what Generation C is all about. So let's have a look at the most important characteristics of Generation C, which very predictably can be summarized using words beginning with the letter C. Well, the first word, something that we have mentioned already, is, of course, connection. Technology is very much integrated throughout the Generation C's life. They live in present tense. They connect across screens. But it also means that they keep looking at the handheld or mobile devices all the time. They've got their faces in their screens. And that's why, by some people, they have actually been called the silent generation. And this picture very nicely summarizes what silent generation is all about. The next important feature is creativity. Generation C don't want to just passively consume content. They want to create content. And that's very much in line with the fact that the development of Web 2.0 has allowed us to create content and share it with others over the net. And that sharing is um, made possible by the community. Generation C want very much to be part of a community. They need to be part of the community. And the, when we talk about community, we are talking uh, about the real community, their select friends and family. But also, we're talking about the followers on social sites um, or the uh, fans or acquaintances uh, from social networks. The next important feature is control. As one of the very fundamental needs of Generation C, they have a very strong desire to be in charge and in control over what they own and create. Now, very famously, in 1968, Andy Warhol said that in the future, everyone will be world famous for 15 min minutes. And we didn't really have to wait long for that prediction to become very, very true. Now, members of Generation
and then to distribute or disseminate their own images and their own ideas, their creations and their content to millions of people, they have gained the possibility of becoming a celebrity, even if it's only as being a celebrity for 15 minutes. And finally, of course, communication. But it's very important to notice that digital communication channels um, have, to a large extent, replaced the physical um, interaction, which is typical of other generations. And that's why Generation C is very often referred to as the silent generation, as we have said earlier. So, to summarize, Generation C are people who are completely at home with technology. They want to remain in contact using mobile communications. They are very content-centric. They want to uh, take part in creating content, which is then shared with other people over the internet. But they also seek control of the world and culture. Now, control of the world and culture has actually been become extremely difficult because the world that we live in is very, very complex. It's actually becoming more and more complex by the minute, especially for our students. Now, I wanted to play a little clip about the future of work here for you, but again, I'm a little worried that the quality of the film is not very good. So I'll just tell you what, um, what concepts are um, explained in that little clip. Um, when we look at the, the world of work, even 10 years ago, especially 20 years ago, there were certain jobs which didn't exist. Jobs in social networking didn't exist. Um, jobs to do with mining big data didn't exist. Um, because of the changes um, in, in terms of technology, um, the world of work has also changed, and it keeps changing. And really, we have no way of predicting what kind of job our students will have throughout their lives and how many times they'll have to change those jobs. Now, the one concept which is very clearly connected with um, that idea that uh, we will be changing our jobs, our students will be changing their jobs many times in, throughout their lifetimes is the concept of 21st century skills. And this is something that I'm sure you have heard about many times because it is one of the big buzzwords in education these days. The question is, is it just a buzzword? Well, we know how much the world has changed and it has changed because of technology innovations. It has changed because of globalization. And finally, because of the technology innovations, because of the globalization and because of the different challenges, how people learn has also changed quite dramatically. So all of this combined creates a very serious need for 21st century learning, which will help us produce learners who will be autonomous and who will be able to continue independent learning long after their formal education has finished. So what are those 21st century skills? Well, because the world cha has changed so much because of the um, development of technology, our ways of thinking have had to change, our ways of working have, ha have had to change, and obviously also tools for working have changed and skills for living. We don't really have time to look at all these uh, 21st century skills. What we are interested in, obviously, most of all, are uh, 21st century education um, skills. Now, some of you may be familiar with um, an online tool, tool which is called Wordle or uh, Word Cloud. Uh, well, what I have done is I have again used some words beginning with our favorite letter, letter C, uh, which refer to the 21st century education. I have put these words into a word cloud. I'm going to uh, put this word cloud up on the screen in a moment and I'd like you to, um, if you can, to type the words that you find in the Wordle into the chat, chat box. Okay, ready? Go.
Okay, I can see people typing already. And of course, it's collaboration, communication, creativity, and critical thinking. Great, well done. People are still typing in. Very good. Okay. There is, however, one C which is not there in that word cloud, and that is the C of competence-based education, which is extremely important in the 21st century. So competence-based education is really all about immediate competence building, which means that at the same time, we are learning and using the knowledge of the skills which we have learned. So the learning and the using are either simultaneous or very much interlinked. So if we look again at what are the characteristics of Generation C, we will see quite a lot of overlap with 21st century um, skills. First of all, there's obviously communication. Then there is connection and community, which helps collaborate. And then, of course, there is creativity. But what we don't see is critical thinking. OK, so what is critical thinking? Now, in order to be able to talk about critical thinking, we need to go back to Bloom's taxonomy, which we have mentioned earlier. So let's have a very quick look at the fundamentals of the taxonomy. Well, Bloom's taxonomy, it really refers to a classification of learning objectives, of educational objectives. And it divides educational objectives into three domains. And the domains are cognitive, affective, and psychomotor. And they are sometimes very loosely referred to as knowing, or the head, feeling or the heart, and doing or the hands. And it's much easier to remember those if we add some pictures. Now, within Bloom's taxonomy, um, within the domains, the important thing is that learning at higher levels depends on having learned the knowledge of this, or having acquired the knowledge and learning the skills at lower levels. And that's why Bloom's taxonomy is very often associated with this kind of pyramid shape. Now, if we're talking about critical thinking, critical thinking belongs in the cognitive domain, so in the head. And it's really all about asking yourself questions. It's about not accepting things without reflection. Now, we're going to do a little activity together. Okay, I'm going to post a few questions um, on the screen, questions that you might ask yourself when you reflect on something that you have done. And the questions are all jumbled up. Your task will be to put these questions in the right order. And when you're ready, can you uh, type the letters in the, right, um, in the correct order into the chat box? And I will show you the correct answers in about half a minute. Thanks a lot for the comment about fantastic graphics. Thank you. OK, we've got, OK, we've got people putting in the letters. OK. OK. Well done. OK. And here are the correct answers. Now, in fact, what we have done together is a nice little activity which you can do with the students as well. Now, why are critical skills so important to us? Well, because, as we have seen earlier, Bloom's taxonomy is one of the underlying concepts in CLIL. So let's have a look at CLIL in slightly more detail. Well, the term CLIL was first used in 1994 by David Marsh um, of University of Uvascula in Finland. And this is what he said about CLIL. He said, CLIL refers to situations where subjects, and here he means things like geography, biology, maths, etc. So um, subjects or parts of subjects are taught through a foreign language with dual focused aim. So we've got a double aim here namely the learning of content, 
So learning of biology, geography, maths, etc. And the simultaneous learning of a foreign language. And of course, in our case, we talk about English as a foreign language, but we have to remember that CLIL is not restricted to English. Now, the very important thing for us is that Generation C have what can only be described as an integrated mindset, and they react really well to this integration of language and content. Okay, so we know that CLIL is a very good type of methodology for uh, 21st century learners, uh, sorry, for Generation C, but, also, but is this kind of methodology also so good for the 21st century learners? So let's have a look at these two things together. Well, first of all, CLIL methodology is very close to the needs of the digital generation because it, it lends itself very well to the use of technology, not only in the classroom, but also outside the classroom. And it is our job as teachers to encourage learners to keep learning outside the classroom using technology. Now, in order to be able to do this effectively, we need to understand what, uh, what um, Generation C is all about. And another very important thing about um, technology is that CLIL, in fact, promotes very meaningful use of technology, for example, through access to experts online. Another important area is situational adaptability, something that we all need in the 21st century. Um, if you think about um, the, the fact that we will be changing, our students will be changing their jobs many times throughout the, their lives. So it's a very important skill. And that skill is, in fact, developed through CLIL because students learn to adapt their thinking and their behavior also the verbal behavior, so the use of language, to different contexts. And then also we've got problem solving, which is another skill which the learners need. Um, and interestingly enough, this is a higher order thinking skill. So one of those skills which are at, towards the top or at the top of the pyramid associated with Bloom's taxonomy. Now, research shows that higher order thinking skills are developed better than students who study in a dual language environment. And also, CLIL helps students develop interpersonal skills through, for example, collaboration. And we mustn't forget about creativity. And again, creativity is one of those skills that students will need in order to function effectively in the 21st century setting. So what are the challenges of CLIL? Well, the first major challenge of CLIL is very nicely summarized in those two pictures. And it's really all about the teaching style. If you think about subject teachers, um, they are responsible for covering um, a large quantity of facts, of information. And this is because the school curriculum um, is constructed in such a way that this is what they have to do. And if you have so much to, um, uh, to give to students, to teach students, the most efficient delivery system may be frontal teaching. So the teacher will be lecturing a lot um, and explaining a lot from the front of the classroom. And of course, students may be asking questions from time to time, um, but the interaction is really, re is really limited. And students usually don't have time to scaffold learners to help them understand everything that they are talking about. In contrast, language teachers, for them, the priority is interaction between students, because this is how students learn language. They need to interact in order to learn to use language. So that's the first major challenge in terms of um, CLIL from the point of view of um, the teacher. And the second um, important type of challenge that comes up quite a lot when you talk to teachers about CLIL is the potential lack of confidence in the other subject. And what I mean here is that, for example, if um, an English language teacher has to teach geography, then they feel comfortable in terms of English and in terms of teaching English, 
but they don't feel so comfortable in terms of geography or history or biology and also the other way around if a biology teacher has to teach biology, biology through the medium of English they will feel very confident and comfortable in the context of biology but they may not necessarily feel so confident in, con in the context of um, English as a foreign language. So what do you do if you're new to CLIL? Well if you look at and I think we've gone a bit too far. Okay, if you look at um, this slide, it shows the four very important features of a successful CLIL lesson. So let's look at planning successful CLIL lessons, which will take into account these features. Okay, so in order to plan effective CLIL lessons, what we need to start with is defining content. So in other words, what is it that I'm going to teach? What are my objectives? But from the point of view of the student, what is it that they're going to learn? So what are the learning outcomes? And here you need to decide what kind of text you're going to use for your lesson. The next stage is linking content with communication. So what kind of language will the students need to be able to work with the content? So what kind of lexis is important? What kind of grammar is important? Collocations, colligations. But also we need to remember about the language of tasks and classroom activities. So students need to have the language to be able to deal not only with the text, with the content, but also to be able to successfully do, successfully do the tasks that we set. The next step is exploring the kind of thinking skills which you can develop. And here we go back to Bloom's taxonomy. So which thinking skills are appropriate for the content that we're teaching? And what tasks will help us to develop higher order thinking skills in students? And this is, this is the state of the lesson where we focus on identifying and organizing knowledge and we do that through the use of graphic organizers, diagrams, timelines, flowcharts, etc. And last but certainly not least, we need to consider culture as a thread throughout the topic. So in other words, we need to look at what are the cultural implications of the topic. Okay, now all this looks very good in theory, but we need to be practical. So let's have a look at um, CLIL lesson structure. The, a CLIL lesson may start with a text. And then what we need to do is we need to look at organization and identification of knowledge. This is something that, of course, we've mentioned. Here, we use the graphic organizers. Then we need to explore language. And then, finally, what we need to do is give students tasks. Now, when we talk about language and when we talk about tasks, a very important concept which we have already mentioned is the concept of scaffolding. So what exactly is scaffolding? Well, scaffolding is really all the strategies and techniques that we as teachers use to first of all highlight the core language in a content subject and then to make this language available and accessible to learners. Okay, this sounds a little bit complicated, so let's put it in um, simpler words. First of all, we know that if we talk about certain subjects, certain pieces of language are bound to come up. And just to give you a very simple example, if we're teaching history, then past simple, or generally speaking, past tenses are bound to come up time and time again. So it's our job as teachers to highlight this kind of language in this content, in this context, so in the context of history. Um, and then making the language available is really all about making the language easier for learners. Now, this slide is quite important, not only because it explains very simply what scaffolding is all about, but it also um, links us with the tasks. And if you look at what I'm highlighting at the moment, uh, right hand side of the screen, you've got um, a link to an online 
tool which you can use to work with students. How? Well, um, when we talk about tasks for students, one of the things that I could, for example, ask you if you were my students in a CLIL lesson um, would be to read um, a text about CLIL and then produce a simple synthetic cartoon using potoons giving the most important information about CLIL. Okay, one um, aspect which we have only so far uh, mentioned in passing is culture. Now, this is something that, um, uh, that is very, very important in terms of CLIL lessons. And in a book written in 2010 called CLIL Content and Language Integrated Learning, David Marsh, his, his core authors, talked about the importance of culture and they said that culture is really the underlying concept for the other three aspects, content, communication and cognition. So if we think back to what we have said already, content, the subject matter, communication, the language and cognition, the thinking skills, the lower or higher order thinking skills. So if this is the underlying concept, then we can imagine those four concepts as a tetrahedron where, where all these concepts are connected to one another. So how do we define culture? Well, culture is a set of shared attitudes, values, goals, and practices that characterizes an institution, organization, or a group. Now, for practical purposes, it's usually broken down into 11 aspects, and it's also for the sake of organizing information. Now, if I show you what these 11 aspects are, you will recognize very quickly that all these areas are tackled time and time again in the course books that we use. Now, that means that there are ample opportunities for us as teachers to link content and culture to achieve some very important CLIL aims. And these aims are building intercultural knowledge and understanding, developing intercultural communication skills, and providing opportunities to study content through different perspectives. So giving students a wider perspective on things. Now, one of the things that we have mentioned um, is tasks and materials. And we have looked at uh, um, an online tool very briefly. But what is very important from the point of view of us as teachers is being able to, to say whether a material that I want to use or a task that I want to give our students is appropriate for, uh, for my learners. Now, uh, Professor Jim, Jim Cummins of University of Toronto has actually developed a matrix which shows the relationship between the cognition, so the intellectual processes which um, take place when we learn, and the language itself. And that matrix has been adapted for the purposes of CLIL. And this is what the matrix looks like. So you'll see that we have an, a, um, a horizontal axis of linguistic demands going from low linguistic demands to high linguistic demands. And then we've got um, an axis for cognitive demands, again going from low cognitive demands to high cognitive demands. Now, if you think about it, um, you know, if we give students tasks which have low cognitive demands, learning is not very likely to take place because students need something with high cognitive demands, something that will stretch them in order for learning to take place. But we also need to think about language. And obviously, for students at lower levels, we can't give them tasks which are very linguistically demanding. So if we think about the practicalities of CLIL, the most likely thing to happen is that we will travel with our students from quadrant three, so tasks and materials which are not very linguistically demanding, but cognitively very demanding, to quadrant four, where we've got both high linguistic demands and high cognitive demands. 
Now, if we look at CLIL in general, what are the main benefits of CLIL? What is it that makes CLIL such an attractive um, uh, proposition for us and for our students? Well, first of all, CLIL builds confidence. And if it builds confidence, it means that students will be progressing more quickly because they're motivated to learn what we teach them. It also helps broaden students' perspective because it combines language, culture, and the elements from the real world. And that obviously helps expand the cultural and the real world knowledge of our students. And again, these are the things which are really important when we think about the fact that students will be um, dealing with a lot of challenges which are brought about by the fact that the world is changing so fast. CLIL also helps develop academic success and it helps students improve their chances of success across the curriculum. So not just in the content subject that we're teaching, whether it's biology or geography or maths, and the language that we're teaching, in our case English as a foreign language, but across the curriculum, so for all school subjects. And all of this combined means that CLIL provides a sense of achievement because students are dealing with very complex matters in a foreign language and that for obvious reasons gives them a sense of progress and a sense of achievement. Now some of you may be familiar with a, uh, with, um, a European network which is called Eurydice and it's a network that suppo they supports and facilitates cooperation within Europe in the field of lifelong learning. Now, David Marsh, whom we have mentioned before and who is, in a way, a father of, of CLIL, um, is an expert in this network. Um, and I wanted to show you a little clip um, in which he talks about the fact that there is no one single model for CLIL. I'm not sure how the film is going to play, whether that's going to be good quality or not, but I thought maybe we can try it because it is quite an important film. Okay, so let's have a look. Um, okay. And let's see if it works. Education in the majority of countries. In around one third of them, this teaching method also occurs within. Okay, it seems that we had a big problem with the film and I understand that also um, my picture and my voice disappeared for a little bit. So I think it's probably not a good idea to try uh, playing that film again. Um, again, as I said earlier, the film really talks about the fact that um, there is no one um, method in which we can organize CLIL teaching. There is no one way in which 
to do it. So really, when in doubt, stand out and do it your way. And that's all that um, I wanted to share with you today. It's a pity that we couldn't watch the films which I wanted to show you, but um, I still think that it's been really um, a really good morning. So thank you very much for uh, taking part in this webinar. Um, and I think uh, Piotr still wants to say a few words to you. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, thank you, Anna, for today's webinar. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for watching and listening. Uh, there has been over 800 of us. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned before, we, uh, we've recorded this session. I'll be uh, putting the link to it in the chat again. You can uh, watch the previous ones, and this one uh, should be uploaded this week. Uh, I'm also uh, placing another link uh, to the upcoming webinars, uh, which uh, will appear on, in March. This will be directed to secondary teachers. Uh, apart from that, let me also invite you to our second uh, today's uh, webinar at uh, 11.30 with uh, Rob Dean. And again, thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you.